everyone, and welcome to another lovely interview on our stage at Room for Discussion. Today, we have a guest who's known for wearing many different hats, whether that's trader, economist, or content creator. And we have the opportunity to see which one fits best today. Once a very successful trader at Citibank, he is known for predicting the widening inequality that followed the global financial crisis. And he's been using his voice to advocate for a more fair economic system ever since. His journey from being born in a working class family to going to some of the most high stakes desks in the likes of London and Tokyo are truly one of a kind. In this interview, we'll dive into his critiques of contemporary economic systems and the complex measures that have deepened the divide between the rich and the rest. In addition, we'll explore how his personal story shaped his current activism and his vision for tackling the economic challenges we face today. Please welcome. Please join us in welcoming Gary Stevenson to the stage. Thank you. Welcome to the stage. Hey. Okay. Do you want me to sit anywhere in particular? Just have a seat right there. So, firstly, of course, thank you for being here. We know your time is very valuable and we really appreciate it. We want to start off simple, of course. We know that you grew up working as a paper boy uh, in Ilford. Did you ever see yourself ending up in the prestigious position of being a big YouTuber? Um, definitely not a YouTuber. Um, I always, I grew up in East London. So in London, we've got these two financial centers, which is the city, which is the historic one in the center. And there's Canary Wharf, which is a bit further east. And, and that went up when I was kind of a kid. So we saw those skyscrapers going up. And, um, oh, is my mic all right? That's good. If you grow up in London and you're good at maths, I think basically you just assume you're going to go into the banking system, basically. So you don't even know what it is. You're like, I want to work in the bank. bank. Am I right? Do you want me to double check my mic's <laughs> going all right? Make sure we're still plugged in. Fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I always thought I'd be a banker, um, not really knowing what it was. But uh, the transition to YouTube was a surprise to everyone, I think. Including myself. I mean, I didn't think I would be an activist. I never wanted to be an activist. Um, I just wanted to be rich, basically. Um, being a YouTuber is weird, because I've, and even my life now is weird, because I've kind of committed myself to trying really hard to be famous, and I, I kind of hate being famous, and it's a sort of a, a weird space to be in. Yeah. Um, like the publisher sent me the paperback cover yesterday. Yeah. And uh, it's just like me on the cover. And you, you kind of look at it and you think, this is going to be like great for my YouTube, but just terrible for my life. Because <laughs> people are just going to recognize me all the time. Um, so I didn't want to be a YouTuber. I didn't want to be an activist. I, I don't want to be a YouTuber and I don't want to be an activist. But um, I made a lot of money by betting the economy will collapse. And, um, yeah. and, and, and I want to stop that. And I'm trying to stop that. And I think that, that YouTube and, um, and activism is the way to do it. Good avenue for it. Yeah, but like sort of dialing back to, of course, when you first entered university, you studied economics and mathematics. Was that always part of the plan? Or was that the result of a specific experience or event? Uh, I applied, when I applied to unis, I applied to half straight maths and half maths and econ. Uh, I went to LSE, which yeah. doesn't have a straight maths course. So I applied to maths and econ basically because they didn't have straight maths. Like when I was, when I was like a teenager, I was very good at maths. I like won, I won a few maths competitions. Um, but really, like when I was a kid, I just wanted to be rich, and I think yeah, that's what I wanted to. I was from a very poor background, you know. I just, yeah. I just thought I wanted to be rich, and um, I grew up in a very, very immigrant area of London, very South Asian area of London. I managed to get into a grammar school, which is like a kind of a free but kind of fancy middle class school where everyone was Indian basically, and. These middle class Indians, they had a very clear idea of what the good jobs were. And they were like, you know, you have to be a trader, basically. That's, that's what you have to do. So I didn't really know what it was, but I just kind of followed, followed their lead, really. Yeah. Hmm. In your new book, which we have here, uh, it's called The Trading Game. You write about your journey into finance, a pivotal moment of which was this car trading game that led to your internship at City, and then after that, your job there. For those who haven't had the opportunity to read it, could you briefly expand on what this game was? Yeah, so back before the 2008 crisis, Citibank used to hire one trader a year to do a card game, basically. And it was, um, it's called the trading game. It's supposed to be a simulation of trading, but 
in reality, and the way I viewed it at the time was, it was a maths game. It was a numbers game. There's no like understanding the markets and looking at these stock prices. It was purely numbers. So there's a set of cards, some high cards, some low cards. We all get the cards, and there's some cards like face down on the table, which get revealed over the course of the game. Mm. And basically, we're just betting on what the total of the cards will be. And um, I was quite lucky. Somebody basically told me about the game before the game started. So I had a little bit of time to like, prep how I was going to do the game. And I think the most interesting thing about the game is most of the students there, like me, were studying numerical courses, basically, celacy, right? So like, pretty much everyone is studying some sort of economics. And um, I knew that basically everyone there would do the same thing, which is calculate their expected value, right? So anybody here who's like, studying a mathematical or statistical course will know about expected value. You're going to calculate your expected value. Anyone who doesn't study it, Basically, if you like, give a numbers game to a math student or a statistics student or an economics student, they're going to calculate the expected value. And because it's a betting game, say you have one guy with a high card and one guy with a low card, they're going to have different expected values. And this guy will quote a higher price and this guy will quite a, quote a lower price. Mm -hmm. And because it's a trading game, it creates this opportunity to buy from the low guy and sell to the higher guy. And... Um, it was very easy to win, especially the first round of that game, basically because the students were so busy doing their calculations that they weren't really thinking about the big picture of the game. And I think in a way, this is a nice metaphor for the problem that we have in economics, which I, which I think this kind of problem continued to happen, basically, which is people who studied economics, they're so focused on the numbers and the models, I think they tend to be very bad at zooming out and looking at the big picture and looking at what's happening. So when I went on to become a trader, I was betting on interest rates. And um, economists basically predicted interest rates would renormalize after 2008 every single year after 2020, 13 years in a row. And they didn't even realize they were doing that. And I think there's this real common problem that happens with Basically, math students, if you're an economic student nowadays, you're a math student. Yeah. And my background is math, you know, I love math. But people who have been really trained to look at numbers, I think they encounter this really common problem of being unable to see the wood for the trees, yeah. which is they're so busy doing the mathematics, yeah. they're so busy crunching the numbers, that they, they're unable to be like, what's happening in the big picture. And that is so, if we have any economic students here, uh, that is so common in economics. If you do economics, especially to like an advanced level, master's degree, PhD, yeah. I did a two-year master's degree at Oxford. You know, it's 77 students on that, really smart kids. They basically locked these 77 kids in the library for two years doing algebra. And it's not easy algebra to do. And it's, it's yeah. a, that's an insane thing to be doing. Yeah. It's in, really, I, I honestly don't think postgraduate economics students should be doing algebra. Mm -hmm. Like, if, you, if you're trying to work out why, you know, kids can't buy houses, and you've inverted a single matrix, you fucked it up. Yeah. Like, that is not, that's not the reason. We're not sending rocket ships to the moon. Yeah. So, so to zoom back to your question, <laughs> the trading game was a numbers game yeah. that Citibank used to hire one trader a year. I won it in, I think, 2006. Um, and I did it by understanding the game rather than, than just concentrating on the numbers. Hmm. And moving to... Uh your job as an interest rate trader. How was the general climate on the trading floor in the wake of a global financial crisis? So I started working June 30th, 2008. So it's about like three and a half months before Lehman goes bankrupt. Um, and the desk that I was on started to make an enormous amount of money when Lima went bankrupt and in the run-up and in the aftermath. So that's obviously like quite an interesting thing, right? Because you have this kind of idea, the credit crisis was like, oh, banks are losing a lot of money, bankers are losing a lot of money. But perhaps some people don't realize that certain areas of the banking system started to generate enormous amounts of money. Like what we did was short-term loans. Yeah. And suddenly there were no long-term loans. Everybody needed short-term loans. We were the only business in town, especially people needed dollars. I was working for Citibank, it was an American bank. So people on my desk started to make a huge amount of money and it was a really, 
there was absolutely no, none of this like, oh, well, isn't that bad? <laughs> of course, because that's not the culture of the trading floor. Like, it was previously an unfashionable area. Suddenly it starts making a ton of money. There's one little story in my book where suddenly like, you could charge customers an enormous amount. And yeah. you've got to bear in mind, I've, I've been there for like three and a half months when Lehman happens. Yeah. So like, I'm like desk junior. I'm like getting coffees. I'm getting lunch. And I'm just kind of watching it happen. But the traders around me are, are able to make huge amounts of money from customers. And there's one point where one trader manages to make $2 million off a customer in one single trade, yeah. which is almost criminal, basically. And this particular guy, you know, traders at the best of times are not the most socially aware in general, but this guy was like one of the worst. And he jumped off of his chair and he, he starts like fist pumping. He goes into like a lunge, like, yeah, like that. And... Um, the guys across the de- just across the trading floor are losing their jobs, right? Oh. And the manager grabs this guy. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? And, and you might think he would say, it's not right for you to celebrate while those guys are losing yeah. their jobs. Yeah. But he grabbed him and he, he pulled him in and he, really close. And he says to him, those guys over there are losing their fucking jobs. Do you want to get paid? Do you want to get paid? Yeah. And I think this really captures like, trading floors are about money. And I think people sometimes think my book is like an attack on the trading floor and saying that a trading floor is an immoral place. But I don't think a trading floor is an immoral place. A trading floor is an intensely amoral place. It's, it's, it's not that they are bad people, although there are definitely bad people there. And if you read the book, you'll see that. This place is intensely designed to reward people for being right yeah. and to punish people for being wrong. There's no morality in it. Yeah. My job and the job of the people around me was literally to look at economies yeah. and say, are they going to be strong or are they going to be weak? Yeah. And I became a very successful trader by betting that economies would yeah. be weak forever. Yeah. There's no bell you can go and ring. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. You know, it's, that's your job. Yeah. That's your job. You know? you, you're, the, you're the fire brigade, but your job is not to put the fire out. It's to work out which houses will burn down. Yeah. And that's, that's just your job. And I think this is... I think in a way it's kind of like a beautiful metaphor for the society we've built where we tell people your job is to get rich your job is to get rich Mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a trained amorality and i think it's so interesting to to look at what that does to the people in the space but sort of rewinding to what you mentioned about the traders making a lot of money at that time it was really it wasn't uncommon to see uh people in their 20s making hundreds of thousands if not millions in their bonuses so did that kind of foster an environment of camaraderie or more competitive Definitely competitive, but there is a kind of a camaraderie about it in a weird way. There's this kind of like sense that you're all on the kind of pirate ship together. Yeah. But there's another scene in the book. There's this. So I work with a guy who was very, very British, very posh, went to boarding school. His dad was in the army, like an officer of the army. And um, he was very proper and he hated that guy who did the lunge. Yeah. That, that guy was a. Uh, we had to change his nationality, actually, because the lawyers in the, but in the book is South African, and he was kind of vulgar, and, yeah. and he hated that guy. And he kind of screwed that guy over and got him fired. Yeah. And um, I was a bit sad about that, because I weirdly liked that weird, like, fist-bumpy guy. Yeah. And he took me out for a walk, and I thought he was going to explain to me, like, why he, like, screwed that guy over. But he just said to me, he said, Gary, I've got a problem. And this guy's about 12 years older than me, and I was super young. I was probably only 23. And I was wondering like, what he's going to say to me. He goes to me, Gary, I've got a problem. We're just walking down like, the street in the middle of Canary Wharf like, through these skyscrapers. And he goes to me, as soon as I meet someone, I need to know whether they're better than me or whether they're worse than me. And I was just, I was just a kid who was just saying this to me. I wasn't saying nothing. I was honestly thinking, what the fuck is this guy going to say? And he goes... If they're better than me, I hate them. I hate them for being better than me. But if they're worse than me, then it's even worse. And I despise them for being worse than me. And I think this is, to be honest, I thought it was quite a beautiful thing to say in a weird way. And and, and so bizarre. But I think it encaptures, it encapsulates, you know, we have these ideas in our culture that go back hundreds of years about individualism. You know, I don't know if you've seen... You can watch videos on the internet of Jordan Peterson crying about the individual. You know what I mean? Like, these are like enlightenment ideas that are, that are big in the history of 
of my country, bigger than the history of the Netherlands, about the strength of the individual. And I think individualism is important, but I think there's this thing that happens where you take it too far yeah. and you train people that their only, that their primary moral good in this world yeah. is to compete and to win. Yeah. And I'm not against competing, I'm not against winning, you know. I think it's important that we, that we make people compete in top jobs so, we, so that we make sure we have competent people in top jobs. But I think if you build a society on competition as like the ultimate moral good, you make people hate each other. Yeah. And it doesn't work because if competition is at the heart, then there's always a winner and a loser. And there's always a better and a worse. And I think if we can't look each other in the face yeah. and talk to each other as equals, regardless of how much money we make, yeah. I think society starts to fall apart. And I think, I think what we're seeing now especially in Britain, but I know it's happening here and across Europe and across the world. You cannot build a society on competition because then the poor cannot stand together. And if the poor cannot stand, stand together, who yeah. protects them from the rich? Yeah, exactly. And speaking of the poor and inequality, in your book, you write extensively about how you made bets on the expected changes in interest rates and the effects on that, of that on inequality. Is there a reason why that area specifically became your forte? I mean, it pro probably is connected to the fact that very few people from a poor background ever get onto the trading floor. Um, nowadays, most, it's a very difficult job to get into. You know, you know, even elite universities, not a lot of kids from poor backgrounds get into university. Yeah. But then, you know, you might think that you just, even if you get in, you get good grades, you'll get a good job, but you won't really, because a lot of it is about who you know, a lot of it is about what's on your CV. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how it works now, but I guess it's similar. When I was at uni, to get a job as a trader, you need to get an internship in your second year of uni. You don't even have your grades yet. Yeah. So like, well, how do they decide who gets the internships if the kids don't have their grades yet? It's basically based on what's on your extracurriculars, right? My extracurriculars, okay, I won a couple of math competitions when I was a teenager, but mainly like, I had to work a side job, you know, to pay for my uni. I was working in a sofa store fluffing yeah. pillows, right? Yeah. These other guys, their parents have been training them for the extracurricular stuff. You know, this guy's like founded the Junior United Nations or some bullshit. This guy's played the clarinet at the Royal Albert Hall. You know what yeah. I mean? I was fluffing pillows. You know, the jobs get given out based on how fucking good you are at clarinet. You know, yeah. so hardly anybody gets in mm -hmm. from a poor background. And I think this is another problem with economics: is if you have whatever seventy people, fifty people, two hundred people in economics department and 98% of them are from a rich background, what the fuck do they know about the economy? Realistically, the only people they know who worry about paying the rent, about paying the bills, they're fucking cleaners. You know what I mean? And, and ultimately, that's 60, 70, 80% of people now. That, that's how they live their lives. So I think for me, you know, I've been able to see it from both sides. I've, I've, I've been to the university, so I know the theory. And, you know, after 2008... The theory is not that complicated, right? Zero interest rates, plus all this QE. The economic theory says that stimulates the economy. But by the beginning of 2011, it, sh it should have been increasingly clear that wasn't working. Yeah. But like I said before, most of these economists, they can't step out of their education. The theory says that's stimulative. It wasn't working. So I just went out and I, I asked my friends, why are you not spending more money? Mm. And, you know, if you've never done that, yeah. do it. Yeah. You know, ask all the new people, why don't you spend more money? You'll recognise very quickly, it's because they don't have any more fucking money. <laughs> so, you know, it, then you see the disconnect, right, which is massive monetary stimulus, massive fiscal stimulus, yeah. ordinary people with no money. What I saw at the time was a generation above mine, the older generation, property-owning generation, and my generation that would never own property. You realise very quickly, you cannot stimulate the economy if ordinary people have no money and losing their houses. Yeah. Um, but the textbooks won't tell you that, you know, yeah. because they'll tell you, well, you're pouring money and somebody's got more money. But what they don't tell you is, well, who is it? Mm. Who is it who has the money? Yeah. Um, so really, I think the reason I became attracted to inequality was to answer the, the fundamental question of, of why is the economy weak? 
And I think the reason the economy is weak is because the money's not filtering down to ordinary people yeah. because it's getting trapped in the accounts of the rich, I think. Yeah. Um, but, it was, you know, this, is, this was not a great moral discovery, you know. This is my job. My job was to bet on interest rates and to make money. So I think it's, and I think it's, this is kind of a, a beautiful irony in the book in, in a way, which is, you know, I, I would consider now in some senses my mission to be a moral mission. You know, I'm trying to stop this slide of Europe back into poverty, which is where it was 100 years ago for the ordinary person. And I reached that by trying to win the game in this phenomenally amoral place, which is the trading floor. Yeah. In your media appearances, you often assert that you were City's best trader in 2011. A recent Financial Times article has shed some doubt on that. Yeah. With some of your former colleagues and bosses saying they're skeptical of your claims. How did you react uh, when you saw your former colleagues calling you a liar? You know, I wasn't surprised. Uh, and I don't think anybody who has read the book will be surprised. Um, the book speaks very candidly should we say, about some of my former colleagues. Uh, and some of them are not happy about it. And these are powerful, rich people, and they're not the kind of people to be quiet when they mm. feel they're being insulted. And they, they were going to take action. They were always going to take action. Um, I, th I think, in a way, there's a kind of... There's something... Again, there's something quite beautiful, and in a way, quite funny, about... You write a book that is saying... We're giving all these power to these selfish people who care only about winning and they're destroying the world. And they turn around and say, you, you didn't win. You know, I, I was Citibank's top trader in 2011. That is true. But it's not even about that. And it, it's about the fact that we are driving a generation into poverty. And, you know, I've got this YouTube channel that, that talks about the collapse of the economy and the collapse of living standards. And I get, you know, 100 messages a day. And by a million miles, the most common message I get on the YouTube channel is tell me how to make money. And I think the response of the traders who I used to work with is the same thing in a way. You know, I'm trying to say, look, if, if we can't escape from this obsession with money and individualism, we're going to drive our society off a cliff. And the poor turn around to me and say, help me make money. And the rich turn around and say, you weren't the best at making money. It's, it's absurd in a way, but I think you, you have to laugh or you'd or you cry, wouldn't you? Yeah, of course. And I mean, you did leave the system by 2014. You decided to retire from trading and you ended up pursuing a master's in economics at Oxford. Uh, would you say the, what was like the driving force behind going back into academia as opposed to staying in trading and just making a lot more money, you know, as per your goal? Um, well, it's two separate things, really, leaving trading and going into academia, because I didn't decide to leave trading to go into academia. In, in a sense, it would be easy for me to say to you, I decided to leave trading because I wanted to, like, stop the collapse of the economy or the collapse of society. But I think the reality is more complicated than that, and the reality is it's kind of the story of the book in a way. You know, the book is about... In a big way, the book is about why I, why I quit trading. And it's, it's not as simple as I was worried about the economy. Like, the truth is, I was betting year after year that society would collapse. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. And in some ways, I still think there's not anything wrong with that. But it made me sick. I got physically sick. I was just, I think something inside me knew that that's not what you do. Um, and I, I probably couldn't succinctly like, squeeze into a soundbite why I quit trading. I think, you know, not to just try and sell the book. I think you have to read the book for that because that's a big story, you know, why I quit trading. Um, why I went into academia, the truth is I did undergrad at LSE, three years at LSE, maths and economics. I was and am very sceptical of economics academia. Um, and I kind of thought going back into academia would be a waste of time. But I did it. I did it to your master at Oxford. For a couple of reasons. Firstly, you know, you quit. You know, I, I volunteered at like some like lefty think tanks and I made a website explaining how wealth inequality destroys living standards. 
But obviously nobody like read the website. Nobody fucking knew who I was, you know. So you're sitting there and you're like, well, there's basically two ways you can go, right? You can you can do it the proper way, go back into the system, try and persuade the economists that they're wrong, or you can do it the improper way, which is you fucking make a YouTube channel, you try and get famous, which is kind of what I'm doing now. Yeah. And I think I knew in my heart of hearts that going back into university would be a waste of time because I did the undergrad. And, you know, when you're on the trading floor, you're getting the best graduates coming through. And I, I could see that these guys are not being taught, like, relevant stuff. But the truth is, if you're going to go out and say on, on TV, on radio, on the internet, that you think the economists are full of shit, you have to go and check first. Yeah. You know, and I'd been out of university for sort of 10 years by then. You have to give them a chance to prove to you that they're definitely full of shit. And they definitely are. But also, you know, I'm British and... To a British, when two British people meet, they can tell very, very quickly somebody's class background. And it's very obvious to anybody British that I'm from a poor background. And, you know, I've, I've got an economics degree from LSE and Oxford. I was one of the top traders in the world, one of the biggest banks in the world. Everything I do, somebody will comment, who the fuck is this guy? He's not an economist. And that is because of the way that I look and the way that I sound. Yeah. Um, so it's important for me to be able to say, I've got a fucking master's from Oxford. And that's bullshit. It shouldn't be important, yeah. but it is. Well, you've mentioned that you were depressed and disillusioned with your education. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? Um, you know, Oxford is a funny place. You know, I, um, y- you have to wear a bow tie and a cape to your exams. You have to. And I got told off one time because when I left my macroeconomics exam, my bow tie was not done up properly. I was 31 years old. And uh, we're in an economy that's collapsing for ordinary people. You walk out of a three-hour macro exam, you get told off because your fucking bow tie is not done up. You know what I mean? And um, you spend three years locked in a library doing algebra with smart people who could be changing the fucking world. And, I, you know, I didn't need to get good grades, and I was kind of... I was kind of trying to piss the professors off because that's the kind of guy that I am. And, uh, you know, I went in to meet one of the professors and he was like, why are you so unhappy with the course? And I said to him, why are you not talking about the things that matter? Why are you not talking about cost of living? Why are you not talking about the housing crisis? And he said to me, housing crisis is only in London. And I said, well, that's because all the jobs are in London. And he said to me, that's not true. I've got a job. This guy's fucking macroeconomics presser at Oxford, right? And he's telling me, you know, tell that to somebody, you know, in the north of England or in a deprived part of, of the country. Oh, you, you can't get a job. Why don't you become fucking macroeconomics professor at Oxford? It's, it's absurd. But the problem is, these guys are fucking rich. Yeah. And, and if the crisis is what I think it is, which is a crisis of inequality, well, crises of inequality look fucking great from the top. They look great from the top. It fucking works for these guys. It works for these guys. And, you know, I went up to one of them very early on in the course. We were learning about interest rates, which is a big part of modern economic theory. I was obviously a very successful interest rates trader. And I said to him, why do you think we've been so wrong on interest rates for the last 10 years? This would have been like late 2017. And by the, at that point, we'd incorrectly predicted a renormalization of rates 10 years in a row. And he said, no, we always knew rates would stay zero, which is like, that's literally what I made my money on, was betting that rates wouldn't stay zero, because everybody thought they would stay zero. And he just said, we knew, we knew rates would stay zero. I couldn't believe it. This guy, you know, that's like categorically provably wrong. This guy didn't even know it happened. So I went home and I sent him the data, look at, you know, you didn't know it. And it was like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. We didn't know it. This guy's teaching interest rates at Oxford. And he doesn't even realize They've been wrong about interest rates for 10 years. Yeah. These guys are so bad, they are unable to recognize that they are bad. Like, this is the state of affairs, and it's crazy. And, and I, can, I could go into any bank in Canary Wharf in the city and get paid a million pounds a year betting against these guys. Yeah. These guys are wrong year after year after year. They don't even fucking notice. It's, it's, it's a comedy. It's a farce. And, and they get paid. They get promoted. You know, we had the guy who was working as economist at Citibank. It, it was a joke how bad he was. We used to laugh at him. The guy is on the UK Monetary Policy Committee now. It's an absolute farce. 
If you look at it, right, if you think about it, the best paid 10,000 economists in the world are all traders, all of them. You never hear from them. And a bunch of rich idiots manage your government. Think about it, right? If, if you're a really smart young economist, you graduate from your undergrad, you've got a choice, right? You, you could go into government, you could go into central banking, you're going to have to do a master's, you're going to have to do a PhD, you're going to have to do a postdoc. If you're lucky, you'll be making good money by the time you're 40, right? You'll be hundreds of thousands of pounds in debt by then. I was a multimillionaire at 25. All of the best people are being sucked out of the system. Your economies are being run by a bunch of posh idiots because the only guys who are going to choose to do those postgrads yeah. are rich guys. If you're poor, you can't afford to do a postgrad. If I go and do a postgrad, who the fuck helps me buy a house? Who helps my brother buy a house? Who helps my sister buy a house? So by design, all of the guys running the economies are rich. They're wrong every year. They're never held to account. You know, this is why I'm pissed off with these guys because they're ruining our countries and they're never held accountable for it. I think uh, on that lovely note, it might be a good time to turn to the audience for some questions. If you guys have a question, please raise your hand. Someone will come to you with a mic. Right over here. Second row. Second row first. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Gary, for everything you're doing with talking about growing inequality. We didn't really get into that topic just yet um, about economic inequality. I suppose we'll get there. I just wanted to ask, as a young person today uh, who is very concerned about the exact issues you were talking about, what do you think is honestly the best way to do what you can to contribute to making a change to this? More specifically, does one wait until one gets a position of significance in some way? Or, is that, or should you do something straight away? Yeah, I think, thank you for doing your best to lean onto the side of the question there. Um, I think young people are in this tricky situation where, like, life is made so hard for young people, especially young people from poorer backgrounds. They have to work so hard to get these jobs, and then when they get these jobs, they're expected to work 100-hour weeks, and it would be remiss of me to turn around to young people and say, you know, come and fight the fight against inequality, when young people have to run this, like, treadmill just to be able to, like, afford a house and a family. So I'm not going to turn around to you and be like, you know, come and support the fight. The truth is, life is hard for young people. And you have to balance your personal needs with your responsibility to society. And how pressing your personal needs are, basically, nowadays, is going to depend a lot who your dad is. Like, if you have a rich dad, fight the fight, because you can afford to fight the fight. But I'm not going to turn around to anybody with a poor dad and say, come and do everything with us. Like, if you need to work your tits off to get that financial security that you're going to need, to provide the kind of life for yourself and for your family and for your kids, then do that. It's about finding that space at some point in your life. And that could be spare time, spare energy, spare money. But look, when you have, I think for me, it's about you take what you need and you give what you can. And maybe right now you're working really, 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 really hard. And all you can do is watch and share my YouTube channel with your friends. And if that's, if that's the only time and energy you have at the moment, that's fine. At some point down the line, you'll have more, and then you can try and give more. And um, look, I'm doing my thing. My plan is to try and educate the public and convince the public that unless we take action on inequality, things will get worse. I believe if enough of the public understand that, we will get change. So from my perspective, I want you to watch my stuff, understand my stuff, share my stuff. If you are ever in a position, create some stuff yourself, you know. You know, some of you could be artists or musicians, or maybe you're, very, maybe you're going to become a prominent economist. Whatever space you end up in, you think about the position you're in, how can you spread the idea? And, you know, you're, you're a very young person right now, so maybe you don't have a massive voice right now, but maybe you can get one down the line. You know, there's a famous French economist, Thomas Piketty. He worked his way all the way up to being a very prominent economist, and then he started doing it. So, look, take what you can... Uh, take what you need and give what you can, basically. When you have time and space, support my stuff, but think about how you can amplify the message yourself. And for every one of you, it will be different the way that you can amplify it. Time for one more question. So, gentleman in the third row. Oh, Hello. Hi. Hi, Gary. Uh, so I have two questions. Um, so one is, um, so you talked about a lot about how... Um, the trading floor was a very amoral place. So I was just wondering, 
do you think that is possible for the financial sector to be uh, humanist? And how do you think that could happen? And second question is from my more for my personal interest, because uh, um, in your book, you mentioned that you were a grime artist. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just wondering how has that you know, career uh, uh, sort of shaped your, I don't know, like just your worldview and, you know, how, like do you take any valuable experiences from, you know, being a musician and uh, grime in particular? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can the trading floor be more humanist? Um, listen, I, I miss the trading floor and I like the trading floor. What I like about the trading floor is the trading floor is a space where a kid like me from nothing, from poverty, can come in and be recognized very quickly as he's better than all these rich guys. He's the guy who's making the predictions. You know, I put out videos at the beginning of COVID saying we're going to have a cost of living crisis, we're going to have an inflation crisis, we're going to have an inequality crisis, stock prices will go up, gold prices will go up, house prices will go up. These were all very good predictions, which nobody was saying at the time. And on the trading floor, if a kid like me makes good predictions that nobody's making at the time, a year later, he's fucking famous. And working where I am now, trying to stop these disasters, I didn't really get a lot of recognition, you know, until I got support from Penguin, basically. You know, I put, at the end of my book, the acknowledgements, I put, I would like to thank God, or whoever it was, who made it so easy to bet on terrible things and so difficult to stop them. Because if it wasn't for you, I'd be on a beach somewhere getting fucking bored out of my skull, basically. Don't expect the traders to save you. They're not going to save you. That doesn't mean you can't go and become a trader, but don't let it get under your skin if you do it. Look. Rich guys are not going to save you. You've got to save yourselves. I'm sorry. That's the way that it works. I'll help you. Maybe some rich people, other rich people will help you. But they're, they're fucking winning from this, you know. The rich are winning from this. Um, with regards to grime, my grime, yeah, I loved grime. You know, for those who don't know, grime was like, um, a, it, it blew up when I was like 14, 15. And it come out of East London, which is where I'm from, which is traditionally, historically, like the poorest part of London. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I wanted to become an MC, uh, and I was never that good, to be honest. Um, I it became a very violent scene very quickly, and people was getting stabbed, you know, people was getting killed. Um, so I was thinking I'll probably become a trader instead. But people probably don't know this, but my sister went on to uh, be involved in the grime like scene, and she wrote a musical about Dizzy Rascal's first album called Poet in the Corner, which was really successful, actually. People don't really know this, and I went to see it, and it was quite good. Um, it was, so I went back to... I stopped me listening to Grime, and then I only started again when I went back to Oxford more recently, because I felt like I needed it in that such a posh place. Um, but look, the more I do my work now... I, I wrote this book. For those who've read it, the book is a very dramatic book. It's, it's getting turned into a film back in the UK. Like It's, it's kind of filmic, and I, I realise more and more that the way to connect to people is in a sense creating art, I think. There's only so many people that will watch a like, straight economics video. Um, so I think we need art and we need music and we need film and we need TV and we need, you know, I'm, I'm doing like a theatre tour. Ultimately, you know, if you want to connect to people, you need to find ways to talk to the soul and you can't do that with just numbers. So, um, yeah, you know, I think, I think the artists can contribute so much, you know, not just grind, but all kinds of artists. Thanks. If you didn't get to ask your question, don't worry. We have another round later. Uh, on the topic of your work as a content creator, you have started uploading videos to YouTube during the peak of economic uncertainty following the COVID lockdowns. Having been a part of some of society's most prestigious spaces, what drove you to becoming a content creator? Yeah, so I, I graduated Oxford 2019, summer 2019, and uh, Oxford kind of pissed me off, so I went traveling for a bit. And then I come back early 2020, and obviously COVID happened. And like my background is I'm an inequality economist, I would say. So we know at the beginning of COVID, governments are going to run massive deficits, massive, massive deficits. Total UK government deficit since the beginning of COVID is at one trillion pounds. Total US is ten trillion dollars. So we're talking about these. These numbers are kind of like twenty, thirty thousand pounds dollars per person. Massive, massive, enormous numbers, and. I think some people don't realize that if the government gives out a trillion euros, somebody accumulates a trillion euros. That's the way the money works. All I wanted to know was who's going to get it. And it was quite tricky to work out who's going to get it, right? Because the kind of narrative is it's going to the furloughed workers. But if you look at the furloughed workers, they're not getting richer. Somebody has to be getting richer because the government's getting a trillion euros poorer. And I kind of, you follow this money through the system and you realize, okay, well, they're not getting richer because they're not getting paid. But the companies are not getting richer because they're shut down. 
So actually the money's accumulating with the customers and the customers are going to accumulate basically proportional to their luxury spend because that's the section of the economy that is shut down. Well, who has the most luxury spending? It's the rich. And if you want to follow that narrative through, like you can, you can look at my early videos on YouTube, I realized really quickly the rich are going to accumulate an absolute ton of money. And nobody was talking about this at the beginning of COVID, right? So you know, nobody knew who I was. I had no public profile. So I started writing some articles. I got an article published at a place called Open Democracy, which is, I never even heard of it, but it's actually quite a popular website. The Guardian didn't even reply to my email. And then that article did well, so the Guardian get back to me, oh, you want to write for the Guardian now? So then I, then I wrote one for the Guardian, and then suddenly, like, suddenly everybody wanted me to write, and then you're writing for all these newspapers, you're writing for all these websites. And um, I got, you know, I've become quite popular with, like, the economics left in the UK, and, you know, you're writing for all these fancy broadsheets. And I got kind of pissed off, basically, because it's all posh people. Posh people, rich people, all these spaces, the political left is posh people, rich people, media is posh people, rich people. Meanwhile, my friends, they're the guys who are going to get screwed over. Nobody's talking to them. So I was like, no more newspapers, YouTube. We're going to do YouTube because, to be honest, it's actually related to this thing about grime. Like, I remember when these guys came up, came up in grime when I was a teenager, when, when I was like 14, 15, these guys like Dizzy Rascal and Wiley and Kano. I remember how much it meant to me that they looked working class and they sounded working class, you know. And these guys, most of them are black guys. But to me, when I saw them, that was me. Because there's so few working class voices on the TV. And I was like, I want people to see what I look like and to hear what I sound like. Because then they're going to know that I'm one of them. So that's why I decided to switch to YouTube. And it was just me and my mate filming videos in his garden. And, you know, for a couple of years, nobody was doing it. But I just feel like people want to... People want to know that there's somebody out there from their background who's on their side. You know, and people like Donald Trump and people like Nigel Farage, and you know, you'll have people here in this country. I don't know who the guy is, but there's a guy everywhere. Yeah. They get through by coming through. I'm like one of you, I'm one of you. Most of the time they're fucking rich. Okay, I'm fucking rich as well, whatever, right? But you can tell, right? They're not from that background. Yeah. So I want to reach ordinary people. I want to, I want to speak to ordinary people. I want to create a place where all the, all the new people are scared, and they're right to be scared, because shit's going bad, right? I want to create a place where they can go, they can be, here's the guy that's going to explain it to us. And people want it on, people want it on YouTube. That's what, that's what they, they, you know, you know, ordinary people don't read The Guardian, you know what I mean? So, so I made that switch, and, and it's going more now, and for those who don't know, my YouTube is called Gary's Economics, and there's an Insta, and there's a TikTok, and there's a Twitter, and there's a Facebook. Um, but yeah, it's big, we've got nearly a million followers now, but look, if, if they're not watching my videos, they're, they're, watching, they're watching Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson and like mad anti-Semitic videos about the banking system and stuff like this. Like, because people are scared. And um, there's a gap. There's a gap to explain to ordinary people in language they understand what's happening. So speaking of the gap, a lot of your videos cover the disjointed nature of the people who decide the economic policies and those affected by them, right? Mm. So would you say social media, or at least the internet at large, has helped in solving that disparity or that issue, or has it only gotten worse? I mean, a lot of money goes into pumping out a lot of mad shit on the internet. And, you know, I, I'm, I was only able to make my YouTube channel because I worked for free for years. And I still don't make no money from the YouTube. You know, I make money from the book now, but I don't make no money from the YouTube. So, you know, YouTube has the same problem as every other source of media, which is at the end, you know, money talks. You know, if I was to go, like, if I was to start selling fucking crypto on my YouTube, I'd make fucking millions. You know, and if I was to like come out and, you know, spin to the right and start talking like anti-immigrant bullshit, I'd make a fucking ton of money. People will fund that. So, of course, like YouTube and the internet is the platform that I've chosen and it gives me a chance to talk directly to the people. But it gives a lot of fucking billionaires a chance to talk directly to the people as well, you know. That's what I'm competing with. Um, so it's just, the YouTube can be a force for good, but it can be a force for evil. You know, it's, it, it, the, the internet is also a fiercely amoral place. You know, it, it, it doesn't pick the winners and losers. We have to do that. Yeah. Um, shifting our focus a little bit to your ideas for reform. You're a member of Patriotic Millionaires. You're a member of Millionaires for Humanity. Both of these campaign, among other things, for wealth tax. Do you see that as a definitive solution or just a step in the right direction? You know, when I talk about how to fix, when you ask me how to fix it, I see that as two questions, always two questions. 
One, and I think this is actually at the moment the less important question, is the kind of technical question of what taxes do you bring in and exactly what do they look like. Um, and a world tax is one of those possible taxes. But there's also, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it to reduce inequality. And we can look at how it's done historically. It doesn't have to be a world tax. The second question, to be honest, I think is the more important question at the moment, is how do you achieve any change? Because at the moment, inequality is not just not getting better, it's aggressively getting worse. So, you know, why is that? You know, because we're losing the political fight. You know, I, I campaigned for a 1% wealth tax on wealth above 10 million pounds. We're not getting that. And even that would not be enough to fix the problem. These guys make 5% a year. You know, 1% is not going to even scratch the sides, really. We're not getting that because we're not winning the battle for hearts and minds. And if you don't win the battle for hearts and minds, then you don't get any of the taxes. So, you know, I could sit here and we could have this wonky discussion over which of the five taxes is the best way to reduce inequality. We're not getting any of them. We're not getting any of them. So, really, the battle I fight is how do you win a big majority of the general public, because the rich will oppose it, most of them, so you need a big majority of the general public, support for reducing inequality in general. Until you have that, you're not going to get any of the taxes. You're not going to get any of them. So, a world tax, yeah, it, it, it could be good, you know, we're not getting it. We're not getting it. And the reason we're not getting it is because we don't have enough support. So I'm working on building the support. So once again, on that optimistic note, we turn to the audience again for some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Someone will come to you. Right at the back there. Do you believe Keir's new government will play into the same corporate elite hands that the populist conservatives did? So I don't expect anything from Keir's government, and I never expect anything from Keir's government. And that's, you know, that's not because I hate Keir Starmer. That's not because I love Keir Starmer. I think it was pretty clear. You know, I talk to people behind the scenes, you know, and I try and, I try and scope it out, you know. Some people tell me, oh, yeah, we played. We don't want to tax the rich because we're trying to win the election. But I think that's bullshit. I, think they, I don't think they're going to give us anything. And some people say to me sometimes, you know, are you going to get into politics? And um, I say, I'm in politics. I'm in politics. You know, you got a million followers on social media talking about economics and politics. You're in politics. Um, I don't expect Labour to give us anything. And I don't expect the centre left, I don't expect the Democrats to give us anything. I don't expect the centre left parties in, in this country, across Europe, to give us anything. My plan is to make them give us something. That's my plan. And people say to me sometimes, why don't you join Labour? Why don't you become an MP? If I join Labour, I become an MP. I have to say what they told me to say. And if they told me to lie, I have to lie. If I get 10, 20 million followers on the internet, then Labour have to say what I tell them to say. You know, I'm, I, I'm, try, I'm here to build power. You win by building power. And um, I don't expect no gifts. I take it. That's the plan. One more question right in the front here. Thank you for first not holding the mic at an angle. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I have followed you on YouTube for a long time. I've even tried reaching out to you, but I get it. There's a million messages. Um, I see that your current approach is thinking that democracy, like the base assumption is that democracy is functioning really well and that there's enough attention by the people, right? Like attention economy, basically, that there's enough attention by the people to follow through and understand and like get into what you're saying. And I'm just wondering, based on other regulatory capture and like the the media capture by like the, the wealthy the powerful and by the industry right because it's, it's profitable right why do you think that trying to talk to the normal people that don't have enough time and energy and curiosity and on top of that you said that right they all care about making money making money making money making money and talking about some massive system that's in the background that they can't directly make profit from will not incentivize them the same way to act on it so how do you, why do you think that approaching the normal people, like, I, I, first, I love what you're doing, right? I, I completely love what you're doing, but, like, have you dipped into political economics and um, also politics and understanding the systems that are supposed to make the change up besides from the people? Like, instead of just looking at bo top, um, bottom up, also the top down approach? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've been bouncing around the UK political economic left for 10 years now. Um, you know, for every one of me, and, and realistically, there is only one person doing what I'm doing, 
There's 25 think tanks that have staff of 10 to 15 that spend all their time writing 37-page PDFs and sending them to politicians. Um, and I'm not saying that's a waste of resources. People are talking to politicians. And people are, there are much more people talking to politicians than there are talking to the general public. And I'm not saying we don't talk to politicians. Um, and I do talk to politicians. More realistically, I talk to people who talk to politicians because politicians don't want to talk to people who swear in the newspapers like I do. Um, I don't think we will win this without broad popular support. I don't think we will. I mean, I don't think we will win this anyway, to be honest. But I don't think we will win this without broad popular support. That, that is my analysis of the situation. And look, I bounced around the left and I worked for these think tanks. And I didn't, listen, I, I, don't, I, I know some people probably think I do what I do because I like to be famous. I don't like to be famous. I decided to do what I do because I don't think we will win this without popular support. And I'm trying to get that popular support. That, that is my analysis of the situation. That is my analysis of the, the structure of power. I think we need it. I think we need it. And I think I'm, for a variety of reasons, I have maybe more ability to try and win that than some others. Um, but look, we need to talk to politicians as well, and we need more people. And I'm not going to win this by myself, you know what I mean? You know. You know, we need people doing what I'm doing in other countries, and we need people talking to politicians as well. But I'll make my analysis of the situation, and I think that the best thing I can do is try to win that popular support. And I'm going to keep trying to do it. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean some of you guys can go and work for think tanks and lobby politicians. And I'm not saying that is not valuable time, you know, go, go and do that as well. But if, you're not, if we are not fighting the battle for hearts and minds, I guarantee you Rupert Murdoch is doing it. You know, and, and if he wins it, because, you know, we are definitely going to get economic change, 100%. The center is failing. More and more people know that the status quo is not working. People demand change, and people will get, we will get change, because more and more people demand change. But I'm not the only guy out there selling change. Rupert Murdoch is selling change as well. And you can see it. You know, the far right is winning more and more and more and more votes. And they will win power, and they will fail on the economy, and they will say it is because we weren't hard enough and they will go further right and you know you know read your history I'm sure you've read it I find it very hard to look at the situation we're in now and not be reminded of how things were 100 years ago and we all know where that went and uh, I don't want us to go that way um, so I think we need to win the politicians but we also need to win the public and that's what I'm going to try and do perfect and as we slowly come towards the end of our interview uh, we wanted to kind of touch on the fact that you are quite big on TikTok. So we could have uh, maybe an ideal version of a quick lightning round, get a few couple uh, clippable moments with short answers. How does that sound? Good? Yeah, sure. I don't watch TikTok, but <laughs> I've got one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're very big on it. I'll say that. Thank yeah. you. Uh, starting off simple, as much as you said you're against it, uh, there's probably a few people in the audience who are aspiring traders and investors. Yeah. Uh, stocks, options, or crypto, where are you sending them? I think crypto is a massive scam. And you know, I know people won't like me to say that. Yeah, I'm short, actively short crypto. I think it's a scam, massive scam. Uh, I'm long stocks. Uh, I'm long property. I'm long all assets, he heavily leveraged. I think assets go up a lot. I think property is the next one to go. What's the biggest misconception people have about rich people and their wealth today? People don't understand how fucking rich they are. The, the, the rich are so rich. You know, sometimes... You know, when you, when you think of all the government debt and all the mortgage debt and all the student debt, people forget someone's on the other side of that. You know, add it all up and work out, like, who's got it? Who's got it? He, you know, Rishi Sunak's worth £700 million. He's going to make £30, £40 million a year, passive income. A million pounds a week, passive income. And, you know, stop and think, what's he going to do with that money? Now, do you think billionaires should exist? So I'm, I'm not against billionaires in principle. I want people to make... I want people to be able to get rich. I want people to be able to, you know, live a good life. Um, a billion pounds, dollars, euros is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's a crazy amount of money. Um, I think it's probably too much. What do you think is more worrying? The rise in inequality between rich and poor or between generations? Well, the old will die and they'll give it to the young. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think rich and poor is... You know, being young is hard. It's a lot easier with a rich dad. You know, yeah. try it. It's good. Um, you know, generational power imbalances are a problem, but, but realistically, I, I, I don't want to get that old fighting the young. You know, a, a big part of my, 
what I think about is how do we win that old over? Because in, in a lot of cases, it's the old that are supporting the right, that are supporting the far right. So um, obviously, we've got a very young audience here at university, you know. Most of you guys are probably already on my side. So think about how do you win your parents? How do you win your grandparents? You know, they think they're winning. I think if they knew what was going to happen to their kids and grandkids, they wouldn't yeah. be so happy. Okay. And finally, keep or slash the bonuses of bankers. Uh, I mean, this is... <laughs> at the end of the day, I don't want to point at the bankers and say they're the bad guys. You know, like... I come from a very poor background and, you know, all of the think tanks and all of the welfare states in the world, none of them came and helped me. The people that pulled me out of poverty were the bankers, you know, and I know I've written this book, which I think is very honest about the banks and the bankers. Um, if you'd have turned around to me when I was 15 and said, we're going to like slash bankers bonuses, I would have turned around to you and said, well, who the fuck gets me out of poverty then? Um, I don't want to build, make villains. You know, I want to I want to create financial security, and that's about fixing systemic change. And um, I don't want them to make us fight each other. And a lot of bankers are very rich. I don't even want to attack the very rich. You know, this needs to be about building systemic change that works. Now, of course, as we come right up to the end, we want to move back to your personal story a bit. Your social media presence has made you into an advocate for change, but also an educator to many, like the ones in the audience. And while we are speaking at our university's economics and business faculty, kind of already touched upon this, but how would you really like to see a change in the way economics is taught? It, it needs to regain that connection with what's happening. How can you have, how little is spoken about the housing crisis and housing affordability? The lack of focus on inequality is absurd. The, the lack of focus on prediction and correct prediction is absurd. I think it's insane that I can go and work, I can go and walk into any bank in the city, get paid a million pounds a year because I'm continually predicting things right, and I can walk into Oxford University and be like, hey, I'm predicting these things right, you're predicting wrong all the time, and they're not interested. That is insane. These people have become untethered from reality, and I think you need to force them, you need to force them to make predictions, and I don't mean fucking back predictions of things that have happened. Fuck back testing. Let's do some fucking forward testing. Look, if you cannot... We need to take the mic away from people who are wrong all the time and give the mic to people who are right sometimes. And I think, I think there's, there's lots of change that needs to be made. Class representation is a disaster. But the biggest thing we can change is actually force these guys to make predictions and test them on it because that will tie them to reality. Yeah. And uh, in your four years now on social media, you've become an advocate and an educator. You've been successful with that. You've got an audience of nearly 900,000. Where do you see yourself going in the next four years? Um, it's, it's, the growth this year has been so much that it's actually been quite difficult for me personally. Just like suddenly, like I'm quite well known in the UK and I get recognised all the time and I get a lot of attention. I get fucking Financial Times writing attack pieces on me, which is not like the kind of like where I want to live my life. You know, I'm getting recognised in Lidl and I'm trying to buy chicken. You know, like this is like my life now. Um, you know, I'm committed to keeping on doing this. Um, the paperback's going to come out. You know, it's got my face on the front. We're going to get a TV show. You know, we're going to get a tour. You know, I'm going to do all them things. Um, <laughs> I've committed myself to making myself the face and the name for this, which is something that is, I'm quite reluctant to do. But I feel like this is, this is my best chance of doing something. You know, I have to win a voice. I have to win power. I want to become... The, per the person that ordinary people trust. Um, and it's stressful, and, and I find it stressful, and often I don't enjoy it. But um, I'm on this ride now. I'll keep riding it. Um, I'm gonna, what I want is to be in a situation where you pull the average man or woman off the street, and you say to them, why do you think life is getting worse? And they say inequality. That's my aim. That's my aim. And um, I'll do everything I can to do that, but there's only so much I can achieve by myself. I need people like yourselves and like the guys who've come to take that message, amplify that message, amplify my platform, but also become amplifiers of the message yourself. Become convinced of it, spread it. Like There's only so much. Yeah, I would prefer this not to be the Gary Stevenson show, but this to be inequality destroying the economy because that is a message that any of you can spread and it doesn't mean that I have to do all the work and carry it on my shoulders. You know, I want... I'm going to build it, I'm going to boost it, but an idea can spread and multiply in a way that a person can't. So, you know, the videos are out there to persuade you guys, and if you guys are persuaded, spread the message yourself.
And on that note, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Stevenson, for your time. And thank you to everyone in the audience for being here. If there are any of you who are still curious about the world of banking and finance, you're, you're in luck. Because on the 31st of October, we have interviews with the CEOs of Kempen Capital Management and APT Asset Management. And on the 7th of November, we'll be hosting Class Notes, President of the Dutch Central Bank and Financial Stability Board. Let's have another round of applause for Mr. Stevenson. Thank you.